Okay, I lined it up. I gave myself what I figured would be a good distance between all the tubes, marked them off, and as I said, left a gap here so you can kind of see, hopefully, those little spots where I've marked those. That's going to be the rectifier. I did give it a little bit of gap from the four power tubes. Then there's a gap here for that, and then the, the, uh, the five preamp tubes. So I've got, and I've gone and used, you should be able to see here, the smallest drill bit I had, and I've used this nail set type marker. You know, you punch it down and it pops and gives you a really good mark in the metal. That gives you a very well designed hole. Then I'm going to do a second drill hole. Uh, that'll be about the size of a stepper bit that I have. And let me grab my stepper bit real quickly. This guy is, is incredible for doing these socket holes. And that's what the stepper bit looks like. But I want the drill bit to be about the size of the end tip so I can just kind of slot it in and go. Um, so I'm going to grab the light, slightly larger drill bit and then I'll start going from there. All right, this part I'm going to film because I want to show you how you have to kind of carefully go a few at a time uh, I, I think there probably would be a semi-intelligent way to measure the exact size that I want to get to, but I basically usually just go slowly, like this. I know that's too small because I can kind of quickly eye it uh, based upon the size of this guy, but I just don't, don't want to rush it and get myself too big because then I'm in trouble. So. Still too small. That's looking closer, but I think that's probably more the size of my preamp tubes. We'll check that out. Yep, see, so that would be the right size for the preamp tubes, but I'm not going to need to do that. So I could actually measure that and see that that's at about the 7 eighths, I think. So I probably want 7 eighths for those. But this guy needs a little bit more, so we'll keep going. Is still, I think, a little too small. Yep, a little too small. One more, maybe. Oh, almost. One more. And now we're kind of getting tight, but I still think I'm going to need one more. Nope, a little bit more still. Perfect. Okay, so that one's done. I don't need to do that one anymore. But then I have to be more cautious of these guys. These ones, I think I showed a little bit ago, I have a special kind of uh, sh uh, top for them. They will sit, this porcelain base sits inside of this little metal shield that then can pop up and lock the tube in place for the EF, uh, for the, the EL84s, the four EL84s. So um, that one has to be able to fit so that this drops just barely in the hole, but that this porcelain still stays kind of in place. So let's try and do that one now. Nope, not there yet. That is getting close. But it needs one more notch at that point. Okay, let's try that one. To get all the debris out of the way. Nope, still not quite there. One more notch. All right, that should be good now. Yep, perfect. All right, so now I can kind of compare them to the holes next to them when I do each of these. Still, you want to go slow. You don't want to overdo it or you end up with a mess because you've ruined your whole chassis. And perfect. Now, the one thing I want to test, now that I'm thinking about it, is these may also fit in those. If not, it might be a little bit bigger. No, it looks like those fit as well. So I can effectively make all the the, the power, the preamp tubes the same. And, you know, it's the same footprint roughly as these two anyway. So, you know, that should be ballpark. All right. And on that one, I actually did go a little wider than these, and because I have a little leeway with these tubes, that's going to be okay, but there, you know, that's me not being careful. I can tell this one's just a next step bigger than these other ones. So because I have a large leeway between the ends of these fins and the output, if, I don't know if that's very visible, but you can see there's a lot of leeway, so I gave myself some error room, but all right, so we're going to come back. I'm going to clean this all up, and get, get out my shop back, clean that up. Then we're going to start the process. I'll be peeling off all of the cover area here, and we'll kind of go from there. But we're going to start the process of lining up the holes for the screws. 
I want to show you a little trick that I've learned about that because I screwed up and have missed holes on those that make it a little bit easier. Okay, you possibly can't see this from this angle. Maybe I'll just tilt it a little bit, but that looks like pretty much what I want. I'll slide it sideways a little so you can see the, sorry, I'm always reversed on the camera. So you can see it's all laid out pretty well. But part of what I wanted to show is one of the things I'm doing here, you notice that one's loose, so that one moved a little bit. Like I said, the other ones are a nice fit. That one I went a little too big, but it's still gonna work. But you always wanna try and avoid that kind of slop. But the other thing you should hopefully be able to see down inside of here is that I've lined up the like open gap of them this way. Because that means most of the pins I'll be trying to work with have this space away from them. There's gonna be still tightness on either side here and here, but ultimately that side over here becomes really tight trying to work inside of it. And so if you can leave your open gaps, and you can probably see it even better here because you can see there's this gap right across that point where the two are there. I'm gonna aim those towards this back side because that's where you have the least room to work in. And I'm also gonna run my heaters back through here. They'll come in and kind of shoot up in uh, at, at angles here, but that gives me room. Uh, and another thing I'm already noticing now that may be uh, a bit of a flaw with my tightness here, heaters, you generally want to have a lot of room and distance, so that's going to be a little close, but I'm sure I'll be okay. Uh, another option, though, would be the uh, heater style where you pull your heaters up in like this in a way, so they come directly down onto the pots. Either way, I will figure that out once I get inside of it, but uh, next step, one of the tips I was going to tell you about is I learned quite often it's really hard if you think you've got it lined up and you mark your where you're going to put your... Um, screw holes for the thing is you will end up accidentally having them a little misaligned and then getting those back is hard. So what I'm gonna do is I'm only gonna do the top row uh, because that way once you drill those you can actually put your screw in, get it perfectly lined up and then put the second one and that way you're guaranteeing your second hole will have alignment with the first hole. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Now these guys here on this side are gonna be a little tricky because of that same, that little bracket thing. I'm gonna have to kind of get this guy on there uh, and my goal is probably going to be to fold them away like that because we have the um, all the chassis tr transformer stuff going on over here. This will allow this to uh, line up that way and then pop up and lock on on top the, the tube like that. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'll have to kind of manually one by one carefully pop these guys across until I feel that alignment as well. But, you know, to start off with, also with the this guy... Um, when you're doing rectifiers normally, you'll have to double check every in every case, but this is an eight pin socket, but you only wire up, um, usually you only wire up two, four, six, and eight. Uh, but that, that's, and then you'll also wire up the, um, the output from one of those. Some people will also add additional diodes for protection. I'm not gonna really worry about that here myself, but they'll also wire those to some of these empty pins. I'll just basically connect to the empty pin that does nothing and then jump it over to the pin that actually is. But ultimately, my bigger point here is just, again, I'm trying to rotate this guy in a way that uh, I'll have to think. I think it might actually be best this way because this is pin 8 here. Well, no, that's pin 8. So I'd want to go this way because this is pin 8, 6, 4, and 2. Uh, so the more I kind of align it that way, this back pin here that's not being used is the one on the back side. So for the same reason, I kind of want to try and rotate this guy like that. So first I'm going to do is try to line this guy about dead center and mark that. And then, like I said, I'll repeat this process through all of them uh, and then carefully try and I'm going to try and get the by eyeball so that they're consistently the same. All right, now I can pull those out. I'm going to quickly get my bit tiniest little bit that I have and I'll quickly drop in on all those So just like that, you can see that was pretty easy to do once I had uh, the marker set and the pinhole set, and then I can just drop in, make sure that fits the hole, we're good. So the next step really is uh, to, we'll just do it with this guy. As I was saying, you can then take and drop in a screw and pretend like you're locking it down. And then you know if that's locked in good there, that if you drop a hole in here, it's gonna work. So I will quickly 
I'm going to remove that and just show this on. Now, like I said, I normally would go with the smallest one, but just in a hurry to show on, on the screen here. I'm going to carefully lock into that little spot. And you now have a hole that's lined up perfectly with what this already had. So I can, again, drop that guy in its hole the way I wanted it. Of course, it's going to fight me and not go in its hole. Now, there we go. And then we get our second screw and we drop it in theory down this hole as well. And of course, I knocked that one out. Perfect. So now I have a perfectly aligned hole, and I can you know bolt that guy in a minute. I'll be peeling off this uh, outer plastic first, but now I can repeat that process as well for each of these other holes, and I'll be done with that. So I think you've seen the one. I won't necessarily show you all of them. All right. So um, this is all done, but I wanted to enjoy the pleasure with you all. Of peeling the plastic off now. It's not always do you get this, but uh, you know maybe none of you guys get, care about this. But I've always been uh, someone that enjoys this part. So if you guys can watch along with me while I do it, peeling off the plastic. satisfying uh so i still am going to have to cut some more of this chassis but you know I, I that's the worst of the book of it so as you can see now i've got these all nicely lined up i can go in and, and put them in as i would like if i would like uh, but i'm just going to show it off because i also have to uh um, well I'm, I'm actually pretty much ready to do that now you can see all of these are ready to go in and the holes should be all lined up perfectly so that i can just drop them in put in the screws and go and that's what I'm going to do next is I'm just going to put them all in and I'll show you. The only other thing I'm going to have to cut into this now is I'll have to cut in, like I mentioned, a power and a fuse here. I'll have to put in the um, output jack here. And I'm, I i don't think it came by default, but it comes with three taps. It's got a, a 4, 8, and 16 tap. So I'll probably put a, get a, a three-way switch for that as well. I haven't got that yet. but uh, And then on the front side, of course, I'll be putting all my inputs, potentiometers, power switch, standby, all of that jazz. Now... It came with a standby switch. Uh, I don't. I'm not a big fan of them because I've I've done a lot of reading and found that standby switches are completely useless. The whole idea that they protected against was something I think was called cathode stripping. You'd let the tubes warm up before you sent high voltage to them. That only can happen, as far as I've understood it, in in studying and researching it. Um, Valvewizard.co.uk has an article about it. There's others. It effectively only if you're dealing with tubes that are over. I can't if it's a thousand or two thousand volts can cathode stripping actually happen. So. Uh, Leo Fender was the first one to put them on his amps. He had known this was a problem in cathode stripping in tubes, but he didn't realize it was that high. So he always added that switch. And as being known as somebody that was very frugal about what he spent on, that seems a bit conspicuous that he put an extra hole switch in there that isn't really needed. Now, some people like him as a mute, but honestly, you could actually put a mute switch yourself in that just kind of shunted to ground somewhere in the chain if you really wanted that, that isn't going to be hard on the tubes. It's much better on the tubes to just turn them on straight and let all of them come up kind of naturally with the high voltage and with the warm up as far as everything I've ever read. So that's a good debate I'll have. Or maybe I'll just change that power switch into some kind of a mute switch as well. So we just shunt everything to ground. Uh, all right, there you have it. And I'm going to put these all in and we'll be back in a minute. All right, there you have it. We've got those all assembled and in. We've got plenty of room in here. And you know, these are a bit tight. I've seen a lot more distance usually in, in the way things work in other tube setups. The only thing we're going to find out, I guess, is if it works or not. But uh, uh, we've got it all set in and, and set up. And if you flip it out the other way, you should be able to see in there as well. There's all of my tubes and whatnot. Uh, all the sockets are in.